In this video, we'll be talking about mood disorders. Uh, in the previous video, we talked about uh, obsessive compulsive disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as kind of evaluating anxiety disorders as, as a whole. Uh, today, in this video, we'll be going over mood disorders, specifically major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, and we'll also do another evaluation kind of of, of all things mood disorders at the end. So uh, when, we, when we start talking about depression uh, in particular or other types of mood disorders, uh, it's important to, to keep note that this is a wide range of, of uh, disorders. Um, mood disorders are, are commonly one of the most sought out uh, treatment uh, or the ones that are most sought out for treatment. Uh, and they have to do with just, you know, kind of that subjective feeling of, of, of feeling down or, or feeling manic, right? Feeling like uh, invincible. So let's get into some of the diagnostic criteria and understand a little bit more about these, uh, uh, you know, major, major mood disorders. So first up is major depressive disorder. This is, this is depression. This is commonly called depression. Symptoms are, uh, you know, discouragement about the future, dissatisfied about life, uh, feeling lethargic, very low energy. This can be caused by social stressors or anything or other things going on in people's lives. And it is the number one reason why people seek mental health uh, services, right? So 5.8% of men, 9.5% of women uh, experience depression at some point in their lives. Um, I'll get from the DSM prevalence. Uh, so 12 month pre uh, prevalence rates of major depressive disorder in the U.S. is 7 percent. Market differences between age groups, 18 to 29, are three, three times as likely to develop a depression than individuals 60 or older. Uh, and females, as it says, uh, are one and a half to threefold higher rates than males beginning in early, early adolescence. So this is, you know, a major, major uh, illness. Um, and. Depression is one where, again, you have these feelings of uh, worthy, worthlessness, isolation. Um, reading from the DSM here, five uh, or more of the following symptoms have to be present during the same two-week period, right? So it's a two-week two -week window and it represent a change from previous functioning. So it has to be some sort of change in life. Um, and one of the symptoms has to be either a depressed mood or loss of interest or pleasure. So... Depressed mood most of the day, nearly every day, um, by subjective reporting or observation with others. Markedly disinterest, uh, diminished interest and pleasure in all or almost activities of the day, nearly every day. Significant weight loss when not gaining or when not dieting or weight gain um, or decrease in appetite. Insomnia or hypersomnia, so again, not sleeping or sleeping too much. Uh, psychomotor agitation uh, nearly every day, so, so like fidgetiness, th those kinds of things. Fatigue, loss of energy, feelings of worthlessness, excessive inappropriate guilt, diminished ability to think, concentrate, or indecisiveness every day, recurrent thoughts of death, uh, suicidal ideation, um, which is thinking about killing yourself. Uh, symptoms cause clinically significant distress, and the episode is not attributable to anything else. So depression, right? This, that's a lot there, right? And there's a lot that kind of depression folds into. It's why it's often called the common cold of uh, mental disorders, right? It just kind of, it, it, it happens. It happens to a lot of people. Um, and from a evolutionary perspective, right? Depression seems like it's something that like it shouldn't happen, right? Why should people feel bad? But if we do take that stock again, and I'm not saying that this is like be, be happy with getting the diagnosed with depression or having depression. Um, but sometimes depression causes us to reevaluate things, right? Uh, even just in the normal kind of ups and downs of life uh, without getting to the clinical, uh, you know, clinically uh, relevant uh, depression. But just kind of the, those moments where we're down, right? It, it pauses things out. It, it calms us down. It, it forces us to reflect um, on our lives, right? So, so the thought process is, is that major depressive disorder is just that kind of an overdrive, right? That we just can't break out of. And when we're very self-critical and, and um, having feelings of guilt, that just, you know, amps up the likelihood of, of major depressive disorder. And again, it has to be two weeks or more. Um, we'll talk more about depression in class, uh, but that's, that's the main diagnostic criteria. There's a lot more here. There's different levels. Um, you know, severe versus mild, um, you know, there's, this is uh, the, mostly correlated with suicide risk. Um, 
that people who have uh, major depressive disorder, uh, that is that is where this suicide risk becomes um, very prominent, uh, which is why it's really important to get help if you are feeling depressed um, or if you're feeling discouraged about future, even if it's not two weeks, even if you're just kind of feeling down, like it's really important to talk to someone and get the help that you need. And I hope you guys know that my door is always open, uh, as is the door of all the counselors here at school, faculty administration, um, you know, just make sure that you have someone in your life to talk to if you're feeling down about anything. Again, whether that's full-blown depression or just kind of feeling like you're stuck in a rut, it's really important to talk things out. Let's switch gears a little bit and talk about bipolar disorder. So bipolar disorder used to be called manic depressive disorder. Uh, and basically people who have bipolar disorder operate between the, these two extremes for the most part. Uh, on one extreme, you have the manic state, um, which is where people feel basically invincible. They're extremely optimistic. And while that might not sound like a bad thing, it actually can cause major issues. People in manic states, tend to uh, never see downsides and things. So, hey, you wanna go to the casino and bet my life savings on, on you know some horse races or something? Like when you're manic, you feel like you can't lose. So when people are manic, they often need protection from themselves, right? They have unlimited energy, it seems, and that they just, they're, they're, they're not fully aware to make competent decisions when people are in a manic state. Then that's characterized by a depressive state, uh, not necessarily in everybody. Sometimes it's manic and then it comes back. Sometimes it's, it's uh, you know, and the windows of this vary from person to person. Um, I should be clear that most people with bipolar disorder don't go like from one extreme to another and then back within seconds. Um, it's usually long periods of time, usually multiple weeks uh, where someone is feeling uh, either manic or or depressed, um, you know, which is why it's called bipolar, right? Going between the extremes. So it's important to realize, right, that this isn't just someone like kind of having mood swings during the day, um, although they can happen in the same day. It's it's prolonged periods, right, uh, of, of mania, right? Two weeks of, of mania, two weeks of depression, right? Um, or, or longer, right? That can, you can imagine having unbounded energy, feeling like you're invincible for two weeks. That, that could lead to some really bad decision making. What we see with bipolar disorder is it tends to affect equal number of men and women. Uh, some famous f people who've had bipolar disorder and spoken fre uh, frequently about it. Uh, so you have uh, Russell Brand, that's Amy Winehouse in the middle. Um, it's Robert Downey Jr., if you don't recognize him without the Iron Man goatee. And that's Catherine Zeta-Jones. Um, you know, so, so there's a lot of successful people that have had bipolar disorder. It's uh, one of the more common ones. It's becoming more common, especially among kids. So again, this data is a little... Uh, old, but now what we see is that uh, bipolar disorder is being diagnosed more with young people than it is in adults. Could that be uh, that young people are just, you know, being diagnosed with it because they're they're that that is now the awareness of psychologists, possibly, right? Is it just because people see these symptoms and they understand them as bipolar disorder? Maybe as well. Uh, and we also know that in adulthood, right, some of these disorders kind of taper off. Um, so you don't see much of an increase in adulthood of people developing bipolar disorder, say in their 40s or 50s. But, uh, you know, we see this sharp increase in, in young people being diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Uh, and now that's the main, most people who are diagnosed with bipolar disorder are, uh, are not adults. So when we talk about mood disorders, right, we, we have to try to explain them from, from a number of different perspectives. So we know, for example, that mood disorders are worldwide. In every culture, in every country, uh, people have depression and bipolar disorder. It is, it is verifiably true. Um, and we also know that those numbers are increasing. So there must be some sort of common cause that is underlying our uh, move towards mood disorders in our lives. We know that women are more vulnerable than men to major depression, although they're about equal for uh, bipolar disorder. Uh, although it, it is interesting that that uh, children, uh, girls are more likely to develop bipolar disorder than boys, uh, but then once they get to adulthood, that that flips, um, and men tend to be more likely to develop bipolar disorder than women. Uh, we also know that most 
uh, episodes self-terminate, right? Mm -hmm. Meaning that they uh, go away on their own, right? If you've ever felt down uh, and didn't have depression, you know that that you tend to feel better after some time, right? That that things kind of like we'll we'll, we'll see lead, later with treatment um, regress towards the mean, right? That that even with, when we're talking about personality, right? That there's, yeah, we act differently in different situations, but at, at some level, right, we are who we are. And, you know, if I'm overly outgoing, then I'm going to need to balance that out by taking, you know, a night for myself, those kinds of things. So we see that with mood disorders as well, that, uh, you know, people with depression, you know, sometimes just get better on their own. Now, as we'll see with therapy, therapy really helps increase when people get better, right? So it's not, I don't want you to get the impression that, oh, I'm, I'm definitely, I feel depressed. I felt depressed for a long time. I'll just wait it out and it'll get better. Um, it could get worse before it gets better. So that's why it's really important to seek out help if you are experiencing any mood disorders. We also know that there's a, a huge correlation between stress and depression. Um, we talked before a little bit in class about anxiety, anxiety disorders being linked to uh, mood disorders, right? That anxiety can lead to depression. Well, if you're stressed about things, right, that can make you feel, you know, why am I not able to handle this? Why am I getting stressed? No one else seems stressed about this. And that could lead down the road to depression. What's interesting that we tend not to think about is uh, mood disorders are biologically driven, right? When people have depression, their heart rate slows, they sleep more, they have chemical imbalances in the brain, right? That these things um, aren't just, you know, in the mind, they actually do uh, are impacted by the body, right? That the body kind of responds to these negative, um, uh, you know, thoughts that the, these, these depressed moods lead to, you know, changes in our body. Um, so, you know, treating mood disorders becomes interesting because you need to treat the whole the whole person right you need to, to deal with the the thought process that they're having you need to deal with the body's responses you need to deal with chemical imbalances in the brain right there's there's a lot of things that you have to attack when when treating depression which is why it often takes a number of different times of therapy or different types of therapy to really kind of get out of the hole here uh, when we talk about depression we also know that mood disorders run in families and we know through association studies and twin studies that there is a genetic component here, um, but they seem to be relatively small. I think that's because depression is so pervasive, right? If we're talking 9% of women and 6% of men will develop depression at some point in their lives, that's, that's, that's a lot of people. So it's probably not uh, a major genetic cause, unlike some of these other disorders that we'll see is, is primarily driven by, by genetics. Mood disorders probably have, they have to have a genetic component, but it's probably less uh, prevalent. Let's talk about what's going on in the brain. So we know that when we talk about mood disorders um, and depression in particular, uh, the brain tends to lack serotonin and norepinephrine, which again, makes sense. If, if the body is slowing down, then it is not having the effect, then the neurotransmitters aren't doing their job, right? So sometimes treatment for depression will involve increasing serotonin levels, increasing norepinephrine levels. Those kinds of things will really help jumpstart the body out of, out of a depressive episode. Um, we also know that uh, there's, for whatever reason, lower levels of omega-3 in depressed patients, right? Which omega-3 is a, a really important um, fatty, uh, fatty acid. Uh, it's really important for brain development, right? So when, when people are depressed and they, they get these levels checked, we see that they're lower levels uh, than, than a neurotypical person. Uh, and we also know that the brain shows less activity, right? So here's uh, a brain scan, uh, of, which you should know as a, as a PET scan, uh, fMR, yeah, PET scan, um, that shows the uh, brain activity, right? So first you can see that the depressed state on May 17th, right? You see the dark blues, right? The darker colors, that's, that's less activity. Manic state, look at all those bright colors, right? Red and, and yellows, those are really... You know, that your brain is very active during that time. But I want to highlight something in the depressed state on the, on the 27th, right? So one, note that that manic state could have lasted a week, right? Uh, maybe not necessarily, but it definitely could have. What do you notice on the second, the, the last image there on the right? Those darker blues are much larger. There's very little yellow even, right, in this 
depressed state. So when we talk about people with bipolar disorder, right, the, the, the depressed state leads, leads to a manic state, which then leads to a deeper depression uh, afterwards, right? So, and then that leads to an increased manic state before. So there's, there's this cycle, which is why it's so important to get help if, if, if you're in this, this cycle here. From a social cognitive perspective, right, we have to think about stressors in our lives. We know that uh, we have learned helplessness sometimes, that we feel like there's nothing we can do to, to overcome our, our issues or our challenges. Um, we also need to understand that, like, when bad things happen to us, like, what's our exp exp explanatory style, right? Who do you blame when you fail the test? Do you blame yourself or do you blame someone else? Um, we've talked before about internal versus external locus of control, right? So here, think about it from a depression standpoint. If you're someone who is depressed and everything that goes wrong in your life is all because of you, right? That's how you view things. It's, then it's important to realize that you can actually use an external locus of control, which feels like you might, you know, be, be giving up or putting things out to fate, but that actually can help you feel better, right? Because if it's not me, it's not, not my fault that I failed the test, that test was just really hard or my teacher was really bad or whatever, whatever, that takes some of the blame off of you and can help lighten the load, right? And, and if you do that enough, that can help, help make you feel better. And we know that there's this cycle here. So uh, I have a little weird PowerPoint graphic here. So we have a negative stressful event in our lives that can lead to a pessimistic explanation, right? Oh, why can't I deal with this, right? Let's say you, uh, let's say you fail your driver's test, right? Which is stressful. You were studying, you're preparing, you're really prepared for that. You, you failed your driver's test, right? So why, what's your ex pessimistic, pessimistic explanation? Oh, I'm just not a good driver. I'll never get this. I'm not able to do it. I'm dumb, whatever. That leads to a hopeless and depressed state, right? So now you feel like there's nothing you can do because you've internalized that negative stressful event. That then depressed state leads to changes in thinking and acting, right? So now maybe I don't want to drive anymore, or I think driving is dumb, or you know, something's going on. And then the next time that like I need to go drive, I feel even more stressed out by the fact that I never got my license, right? My parents are out, you know, your parents are out of town, you need to go grocery shopping or something, and you can't because you don't have your driver's license, you can see how this creates a cycle, right? That this, the stressful events lead to pessimistic explanations, which leads to a hopeless or depressed state, which leads to changes in our way of thinking and acting, which can then amplify negative stressful events, starting the cycle all over again. So mood disorders are uh, extremely important. They are pervasive in the world, right? The, as I said, they're global. Um, we see we see high rates of, of mood disorders uh, throughout the world, and and it's really important to understand them. And it's really important to know that that you know one of the ways to get out of it is to talk to people about what you're feeling. Um, that's really tough as guys to do, but I, I encourage you all that if you are struggling or you are feeling stress or or feeling bad about yourself or that you feel hopeless in any way, that you please reach out to someone, someone that you trust, someone that you can talk to. Um, and, and get the help that you need because, you know, feeling bad about yourself is not, for lack of a better phrase, it doesn't feel good. So we need to, we need to make sure that, that, you know, we're, we're healthy and, and, uh, able to live our lives as best we can. Hey, a little hopeful message, I guess, at the end, uh, uh, next time, next video, we'll talk about schizophrenia, uh, and then we'll start. That's one of the last major, uh, disorders that we're going to talk about in these videos, uh, we'll talk a little bit about some personality stuff too, but schizophrenia is the last big one, uh, which will be coming up in the next video. I will uh, see you guys next time.